Hey friends, Father's Day is coming up on June 19th, so don't forget. And if you're anything like me, you're probably still racking your brain over what gift to get the old man this year. But don't worry, because I got you covered, because I'm partnering with the luxury wallet brand, Exter. Exter has some of the coolest wallets on the market right now, providing luxurious quality and cutting edge technology for everyday prices. They boast a sleek, minimalistic design, giving you speedy access to up to 12 different cards, and they boast advanced RFID protection to prevent any cyberpunk bandits from emptying your bank accounts. But my favorite feature, without a shadow of a doubt, is the solar-powered tracking device that lets you trace your wallet's location from your smartphone. Just two hours in the sun leaves the tracker charged for three months, and a two-way ringer system allows you to find your wallet and lets you know if you get too far away from it, basically warning you if you're about to leave it behind somewhere. As someone who's gone through the pain of having to replace all my cards and IDs, as well as having to purchase a whole new wallet, this is the feature that's really wowed me, and I'm sure all your dads will love it too. Right now, Exter is running a 25% off Father's Day sale, meaning there's no better time to get your hands on one of these awesome wallets, even if it's just to replace your own. So, if you're interested in picking up the last wallet you'll ever own, head over to exter.com and check out their range of stylish, cutting-edge wallets that are almost impossible to lose. And without further ado, on with today's video. The summer break I turned 17 started as one of the best of my whole childhood, and it ended as one of the worst. First off, my parents took my little brother on vacation without me, which I know might sound like a mean thing to do, but I was glad not to go for two reasons. Number one, they could only barely afford to head down to Florida for 10 days, so me not going would make it much easier on their finances. And number two, I was at that age where you really start to value your independence. So the idea of getting to be home alone for just over a week was like a whole adventure to me. It was flattering that they even trusted me to take care of myself. So that was exciting and then the idea of having the whole house to myself so I could just chill and do my thing without being bothered by my little brother and his friends, that really sold it to me. But unfortunately, opting to stay home was one of the worst decisions I'd ever made and left the door wide open for one of the most traumatic and frightening experiences of all my teenage years. Four days into me living my very own utopian teenage girl version of Home Alone, I was really getting into the swing of things in terms of taking care of myself. I was cooking for myself, doing my own laundry, having friends over for dinner and movie nights. I felt like an actual adult. I kept the place clean and tidy, put the garbage out, and even the whole getting little chores done like that gave me an awesome sense of self-sufficiency. It is not as if I wasn't aware of the dangers. A friend of mine had joked about the whole home alone thing and asked me what I'd do if a pair of home invaders turned up, intent on robbing the place while I was still inside. The reality of such a thing absolutely scared me and I wasn't even in the mood to joke about such a possibility as I'd never actually put much thought into it. My dad didn't keep a gun in the house, we didn't have a dog and aside from frantically dialing 911, I had no clue how I'd defend myself if something like that happened. I actually started running through scenarios in my head after that and I decided that the best thing to do if I heard or saw any signs of potential intruders would be as follows. I'd grab a knife from the kitchen, then run upstairs to my bedroom with my phone to call 911. I'd lock my bedroom door, then run into my closet and just wait the whole thing out until the cops showed up. The goal was obviously to avoid any kind of physical confrontation, as even with a knife, I don't think there was much a 5 foot nothing, 110 pound girl would be able to do to one larger guy, let alone two or three of them. But then the more I thought about it, the more I figured that the chances of it actually happening were slim to none. By day 5, I only had 5 more sleeps to go, so the idea that I'd be unlucky enough to have an incident in that time seemed like a really far out possibility, enough so that it actually really eased my mind and I stopped worrying about it altogether. But then, like so many things in life, which only happen when you least expect them to, 
My worst fear of my home alone scenario actually happened, and it was way worse than I ever could have imagined. It was the sixth night of me being home alone. It was coming up on 10 p.m. on this horribly rainy evening, and I had been binge-watching Grey's Anatomy for the second night in a row. Our TV room had these big sliding glass doors that looked out onto the backyard, and as the sky got darker and darker, I thought I saw something moving in the bushes at the end of our backyard. I remember looking up from the TV like, huh? Wondering if it was just my eyes playing tricks on me. But then I saw them move again. They rustled really low down, near the soil, and I remember thinking, oh, it's just the neighbor's cat because he used to always jump the fence and go hunting in our backyard close to sundown. But then, even though that seemed to be the most logical explanation at the time, something about it just didn't sit right with me, and by the time it was almost dark, I thought I'd better go grab a flashlight and make sure it was nothing but a cat having stalked through the backyard. I'm not one of these people who can just shrug something off like that and hope for the best, and besides, I knew that unless I actually went to check, I'd be worrying about it all night. So, that's what I did. I grabbed the flashlight from the cabinet near our kitchen's back door, then wandered out into the twilight to make sure everything was all clear. Then right as I'm walking towards the bushes near the rear of the yard, one of them really clearly twitches again. The movement made me freeze in my tracks because I didn't see any cat rushing out from under them, which meant that something else was squatting down there for whatever ungodly reason. Then just as I'm backing up away from them, I see this single person just rise up from the greenery and start to stride towards me. I didn't stick around to see who they were or what they looked like, I just turned around and bolted back inside, executing the well-thought-out plan that I thought I'd never have to put into action. I zoomed over to the knife block, grabbed the biggest one I could find, then grab my phone from the couch before powering up the stairs, taking them two at a time. Then I ran into my bedroom, locked the door behind me, then hid in the closet before dialing 911. I figured if whoever it was wanted to break in, they'd have a hard time doing so, as all our doors seemed pretty secure, and they'd have a pretty high chance of injuring themselves if they wanted to smash through the glass of our TV room. So as much as I was obviously terrified by what was going on, I was able to keep myself calm enough to tell the nice 911 dispatcher what the deal was, assuming that I'd be relatively safe. And now's about the right time to tell you that we had this one really creaky stair in our house, one that I'd become accustomed to skipping if I wanted to sneak downstairs after everyone else in my family had gone to bed. Then just as I'm giving the 911 dispatcher my address, I hear the telltale sound of that squeaky stair where someone had obviously stepped on it. That was the moment I realized that, in my rush to grab the knife and my phone, I hadn't actually shut the back door properly, and whoever had been in my backyard had just been able to follow me into the house. The last thing I whispered to the dispatcher before I fell completely silent and thumbed down the volume of the call was, they're in my house. But as the dispatcher assured me that the cops are on their way and that they'd have their lights and sirens on to try and scare off whoever was there, I wondered if they'd actually make it on time. But even so, my doors were locked and like I said, we had these big thick doors in our house so it wasn't like they'd have an easy time getting into my room. That's assuming that they weren't just there to rob us, in which case they'd probably just jack the TV and maybe the stereo system before moving on. But then, why were they coming upstairs? If for no other reason than to find me. The thought just about scared me half to death. All that stood between me and this home invader was the lock on my door, and if they actually wanted to find me and not just rob us, would it really last that long if they wanted to break it? The answer to that, in a word, was no. The person hunting me, it was painfully obvious which room I was hiding in, and that was because mine was the only bedroom which was locked. It took no more than two impacts, be they shoulder barges or kicks, and I heard the lock splinter as the door busted open. I just held my breath, muted the 911 call completely, and stayed deathly still in the closet while I heard footsteps on the carpet outside the door. There were a few more footsteps as whoever it was made their way into the middle of my room, 
and I heard the last few heavy breaths from the exertion of bashing in my door. Then, and I swear to God, this wasn't just my mind playing tricks on me, I heard the person sniff the air, like a dog trying to sniff out its prey. I honestly didn't think that I could get any more scared, but hearing the guy sniff the air like that, like he was some kind of animal, I could hear my own heartbeat after that. That's how terrified I was. Then after a few minutes that felt like much, much longer, with me keeping the 911 call going despite not saying anything or hearing anything, it felt like the room had gone quiet again. There were no footsteps, no heavy breathing, no movement at all by the sounds of things, so I started to think that maybe what I'd heard was the guy walking in to check if there was anyone immediately visible, then when he didn't see anyone he just walked right out again. My closet was the kind that had little slats on it, and if you put your eyes real close to them, you can see what's on the other side. So to check if the coast was clear, I really, really quietly leaned up, careful not to make a single sound, then peered through the slats. What I saw was the single most terrifying thing I'd ever seen, an image that'll be burned into my mind until the day I die. It was a man alright, with not a single scrap of clothing on him but he seemed to be almost completely covered in mud, which I'm guessing had either come from our backyard or some other yard in the neighborhood. The reason why I hadn't heard him at all is because he was stood almost perfectly still in the center of my room, and it looked like he was just staring at nothing. I couldn't see exactly what his eyes were focused on, but from where I was watching from, it just looked like a blank patch of wall. And when I said almost perfectly still, he would have been if he wasn't sort of twitching every few seconds. His head jerked a little, his hands seemed to be shaking a little too. I mean there was clearly something horribly wrong with this guy. He definitely wasn't your average thief or home invader. I've never been a particularly religious person, and I feel a little guilty saying this given the context, but I still don't really believe despite the way this turned out. But for the first time since I was a kid, I actually prayed. I mean really prayed, with all my heart and soul, begging whatever was out there to make it so that the guy didn't check the closet. Thankfully, he didn't. And right as I was praying so hard I felt myself trembling, and I heard the sirens coming from the approaching cop cars. The guy didn't run, at least it didn't sound like he did. I just heard more footsteps and then that was it. I stayed in the closet until I heard the cops enter the house, presumably through the back door, and I only came out when I could hear them getting close to my bedroom. The cops took me to my aunt's place in the next county over, and she made me some hot tea when I went over exactly what the guy looked like with them. Me and my aunt wanted to keep the whole thing a secret from my mom and dad so it wouldn't have them worrying and ruin their vacation, but this one cop said that as much as he hated to have to do it, he was obligated to contact the homeowner if a crime had been committed on their property. And that's how the vacation ended a few days early, and they immediately drove back here to Charleston, non-stop from Key West. Mom was distraught and my dad was furious, but there wasn't anything they could do but demand the cops to find the guy before he actually hurt anyone. Weird thing is, I don't think they ever did. I don't know if the guy moved on or it was just a one-time thing, I mean, the fact that he was totally naked and twitching made me think that it was just someone who'd suffered a complete mental breakdown, or maybe the guy was on PCP or something and it got picked up for something else. There were no more summers alone after that, but it didn't really affect me all that much because within a few years I'd moved off to college. My brother was never allowed to be home alone, though. Even when he was 19 and hoping to move out, Mom would always insist that he accompany her to Walmart or wherever they were going, and my parents went ham with the security system and super secure locks on the doors. Can't blame them, really. Not after something like that happens. A straight-up burglary or home invasion is one thing, but a totally naked, mud-covered, twitchy guy? I understand why they'd never want to risk anything like that happening ever again. When I was in my final year of university, me and a few friends of mine decided to fly down to South Africa to do some surfing at Nahoon Reef. 
Our first session started off well, but when I was paddling back out, a shark came up and grabbed hold of my surfboard and my arm and dragged me down to the bottom. It happened so quickly I had no idea what was going on. One shark hit me with a lot of force, throwing me into the air. In a split second, it grabbed my hand and surfboard in its jaws, dragging me underwater with it. Everything seemed to slow down. I started to feel pain and the next thing I knew, I was staring at a shark straight in the face. I think the shark was confused because it stared back at me for a few moments as if in awe. Its mouth was wide open. I could see a huge set of teeth and a dark black eye. It bolted past me and I felt a shove from behind. It must have brushed along my back, but thankfully it had not bitten me. After it passed, I swam to the surface as fast as I could. When I got there, I saw my surfboard lying in front of me with a bite mark on it. As I climbed on and pulled away, I saw that my right hand was hanging off. It had a gaping hole in it and my wrist bone was sticking out after the shark had bitten right through it. There was a tear in my wetsuit and blood was rushing out of my hands. I panicked, my adrenaline going into overdrive. All the other surfers were paddling frantically towards the beach. No one stayed in the water to help me out. I was about a hundred meters out at sea, all by myself, and the ocean went completely flat. There was no wave for me to catch. I was shaking, crying and panicking, seeing my life flash in front of me, realizing that I could die and feeling as if though I was in a nightmare. Then, out of the blue, a big wave rocked up and I managed to ride it on my stomach before paddling furiously for another 20 minutes through a deep water channel. Every time I took a stroke, my fingers felt as if they were going to fall off. I could feel the water rushing through my bones, tendons, and joints. The whole time I was worried that the shark would come back. Eventually I made it to dry land. I felt a huge surge of relief, but my wrist was bleeding severely. Someone tied my arm with a surfboard leg rope to slow the bleeding and my friend rushed me to the hospital. I had to wait about five hours for surgery, but I was fortunate enough to have been assigned to one of the best hand surgeons in the country who managed to sew my fingers back together. The shark had bitten through my arm as well as my wrist bone, so that was in a cast for a while. I still have a scar on my right wrist, another on my pinky, and one on my ring finger that runs almost from the top to the tip. That day changed my life, but it hasn't stopped me from surfing and now I'm even more grateful to be alive than I was before the attack. A few years ago, me and an old climbing buddy of mine decided to drive out to a place called Rattlesnake Buttress over in Joshua Tree National Park. We found this really cool looking waterfall that had eroded the rocks around it to the point where it looked like it might have been from another planet or something. It made for a great photo opportunity too, so after snapping a few pictures of it, we decided to climb it as a kind of miniature challenge. It was challenging in that the rocks were all smoothed off so there wasn't much to grip on the way, but it was also like a mini climb because the waterfall wasn't even all that high and it was a fairly gentle gradient so neither of us thought that it would be that difficult. My buddy took the lead, and although it was a fairly challenging climb, we made it almost to the top without any setbacks. Then right as my buddy is about to scramble up to the top, he slips and goes tumbling past me, all the way back down to the bottom. I don't know how he didn't take me out on the way down, I mean he must have passed just a few inches from me as he fell. I remember my entire body tensing up as I prepared to take the impact, but then nothing came. Next thing I know, I can hear some of the most gut-wrenching cries of agony I've ever heard. It wasn't even that my buddy was screaming. It was how weirdly muffled and distorted they sound. And I knew in that moment that he must have suffered some kind of horrible facial injury when he fell the 20 or 30 feet down. I moved as fast as I could to get down to him, and I called 911 the second I had the hands free to get to my phone without risking a fall myself. But when I actually got down to him, his injuries were worse than I ever could have imagined. He definitely smashed his head a few times on the way down, but since he wore a helmet, I was safe in the knowledge that 
he wouldn't have suffered any catastrophic head injuries. He definitely broke his leg, a horrible break too because his shin bone had ripped through the skin, but without a doubt, it was his face that tore me up the most. I was right in assuming that from his cries that he'd smashed his face on the way down, but Jesus Christ, he was barely recognizable. His nose was all busted up, and the way he was lying meant that blood had poured all over his face, pooling in his eye sockets, making it so he couldn't see. And then, the part that actually traumatized me for a while, I couldn't tell where his mouth was. He'd bitten down onto the skin between his bottom lip and his chin so bad that it looked like he had a second mouth. I panicked at first, thinking that he had this huge hole in his face, but that was his actual mouth. It took maybe two hours tops for the EMTs to show up, then another two hours to use ropes to lift him out of the hole that he was in and into a helicopter to be airlifted to the hospital. Somehow, he was only in the hospital for about a month, and we were all happy but shocked when he eventually regained full mobility and was able to climb again. I mean, all the doctors who dealt with him were shocked at what a full recovery he'd made, said that he was either super strong and resilient or just incredibly lucky. Either way, it was easily one of the most horrifying things that ever happened to anyone while I'd been climbing while we were on summer break, and I honestly think it was one of the most traumatizing moments of my life. Seeing him torn up like that was such a shock to the system. Part of me thought that he wasn't going to survive. He has this huge scar below his lip to remind us of it too, and it's always visible because the facial hair won't grow there anymore. I'm so glad I didn't lose him that day though. He's been one of my best friends since childhood, and if I ended up losing him in such a horrible way, I'm not sure if I'd ever have gone climbing again. For 18-year-old Natalie Holloway, the summer of 2005 was supposed to be one of the most special of her entire life. Following her high school graduation, she and over a hundred of her fellow students flew out to the Caribbean island of Aruba for four days of celebration, but it was a trip she would never return from. What followed is potentially one of the most disturbing international missing person cases in contemporary history one with twists and turns involving a jet-setting murderer, false accusations, and modern-day slavery. Natalie Ann Holloway was in Memphis, Tennessee on October 21st of 1986. She was the eldest daughter of Dave and Elizabeth Holloway, but following their divorce in 1993, Natalie and her younger brother became the stepchildren of prominent Alabama businessman George Twitty. Natalie spent her teenage years in the affluent Birmingham suburb of Mountain Brook and became a member of the National Honor Society while attending Mountain Brook High School. After returning from Aruba, she had planned to pursue a pre-med track, but as we already know, that never came to pass. Natalie and 124 of her classmates traveled to the Caribbean on Thursday, May 26, 2005, accompanied by seven adult chaperones. Jody Behrman, the teacher who organized the trip stated that the chaperones were not supposed to keep up with every move, and instead opted for daily meetings to ensure everything was fine. After all, the trip was supposed to celebrate their newfound freedom, and the chaperones knew any attempts to be overbearing would be rebuffed with contempt. It might come as no surprise that the newly graduated high schoolers abused this newfound freedom, but then combined with the fact that Aruba's legal drinking age is 18, and it made for some pretty messy results. Two of Holloway's classmates, Liz Kane and Claire Fearman, agreed that the level of alcohol consumed by the group was excessive, and admitted that the Mountain Brook students engaged in wild partying, a lot of drinking, and lots of room switching every night. Their antics were so raucous that, at one point, the manager of the Holiday Inn that they were stayed in took one of the chaperones aside to inform them that they would no longer be taking bookings from Mountain Brook, as the students were making life unbearable for the hotel staff. Natalie was no exception, and was said to have consumed alcohol all day, every day. Some of her friends later noted that she was skipping breakfast in order to start her days with pre-mixed cocktails, which as many of us know, is nothing short of a recipe for disaster. 
Sunday, May 29th, saw Natalie engage in yet another day of heavy drinking, and after a small dinner, she and her friends visited two establishments named the Aronjestad Bar and Carlos and Charlie's. In the wee small hours of the following morning, Natalie's friends spotted her leaving one of the bars at around 1.30 a.m. with a young man by the name of Joran van der Schlaut. Joran was a 17-year-old Dutch honor student who was living in Aruba whilst attending a local international school. Natalie was due to fly back to Alabama the following day, but when she failed to show up for her return flight, her friends grew increasingly concerned. Some speculated that she'd flown home early, but the discovery of her passport and luggage in her hotel room ruled this theory out completely. At the behest of her family, Aruban authorities began searching the island, as well as its surrounding waters, but not a trace of Natalie could be found. In order to aid and coordinate the search for their daughter, Natalie's mother and stepfather flew out to Aruba almost immediately. They had been conducting their own information-gathering mission back at home, and within just a few hours of their arrival, they presented Aruban police with the name of Joran van der Schlaut, the very same boy that Natalie had been seen cavorting with the night before. Their identification was aided by the Holiday Inn's manager, who had recognized Joran from the CCTV footage of Natalie leaving the bar they'd been drinking at. To the family's horror, Joran had a reputation as something of a playboy. But not only that, the hotel's manager said that something about him terrified her, that he had the cold, dead eyes of a sociopath. If Natalie had indeed left the bar with him whilst in a state of intoxication, there was a large chance that she was in grave danger. After learning of this, Natalie's parents rushed to the Van der Schlaut family home, accompanied by two Aruban policemen. When Joran's mother summoned him to a meeting with them, their fears only worsened when he denied knowing anything about Natalie, and it was only when confronted with the CCTV footage that he admitted having spent the evening with her. Joran said that he and a friend of his drove Natalie to a stretch of shoreline called Arashi Beach, claiming that Natalie had wanted to see the sharks that frequented the area's crystal blue waters. Following the visit to Arashi Beach, Yuran stated that he and his friend had taken Natalie back to the Holiday Inn at around 2 a.m. Yet as they were driving away, he noticed she was being approached by a man wearing the same kind of black shirt worn by the hotel's security guards. Following a heartfelt plea from Natalie's family, hundreds of volunteers from Aruba and the United States joined in the search and rescue efforts. The Aruban government gave thousands of civil servants the day off to participate in the rescue effort, and while 50 Dutch marines conducted an extensive search of the shoreline, Aruban banks raised just over $20,000 to aid volunteer search teams. Contrary to Joran van der Schlaut's version of events, Natalie did not appear on any nighttime surveillance footage from the Holiday Inn's lobby. This initially led investigators to conclude that she hadn't returned home that night, but the Aruban police commissioner later stated that Holloway did not have to go through the lobby to return to her room, meaning that, for the time being, there was no way of knowing if Joran was lying or not. Then, on June 5th of 2005, Aruban authorities announced the arrest of two former security guards named Nick John and Abraham Jones. The two men were known to cruise hotels in order to pick up women, and at least one of them had a history of criminality. However, just over a week later, both men were released without charge. Their release was heavily influenced by the police's decision to arrest Joran van der Schlaut on suspicion of kidnapping and murder. Police Commissioner Gerald Dompig told the Associated Press that one of Joran's friends admitted that something bad had happened to Natalie after the suspects took her to the beach. Following an accusation from Joran van der Schlaut, his two friends Deepak Kalpo and Satish Kalpo were arrested on similar charges, and what followed was a bout of three-way finger-pointing in which each of the suspects attempted to incriminate the others. However, based on physical evidence and witness testimony, the Kalpo brothers were later released, while Joran's period of detention was extended by 60 days. Yet while prosecutors attempted to build a case against Joran, there was still the matter of finding Natalie. It wasn't yet clear if she was dead or alive, so on July 4th of 2005, the Dutch Air Force deployed three F-16 fighter jets, each equipped with infrared sensors, 
but not a trace of any living person could be found in the search area. Dutch marines then combed the area in an attempt to uncover any kind of makeshift grave, but again, nothing was found. Following these searches, a number of reports came in from varying sources, stating that Natalie's body could have been dumped in a small pond near the Aruba Racket Club. Another person claimed that he'd spotted men burying a blonde-haired woman in a landfill on the afternoon of May 30th. Both sites were searched intensively, but neither proved to be the location of Natalie's corpse. As the search grew more and more desperate, Natalie's family increased the reward for her safe return from just over $200,000 to more than a million, while the FBI offered their assistance to the Aruban authorities. After a piece of duct tape with strands of blonde hair stuck to it was located, a new suspect emerged in the case. 21-year-old Freddie Aaron Batsis had previously been suspected of inappropriate physical contact with an underage girl, and it was suspected that Joran van der Schlout and the Kalpo brothers were involved in the same incident. In the months that followed, Joran van der Schlout gave several press interviews which attempted to explain his version of events. Perhaps the most infamous was one in which Joran claimed that Natalie had wanted to engage in intimate relations with him, but he had refused on account of not having protection. This version of events saw Joran claim that he'd left Natalie alone on Arashi Beach at around 3 in the morning, and that he felt partially responsible for her disappearance having not driven her back to her hotel. He also added that he was almost certain that Natalie was alive, and that the whole ordeal was just a brief but horrible chapter that would soon have a happy ending. Shortly before resigning his post, Police Commissioner Dompig gave an interview to CBS News in which he shared his own private theory. He declared that he no longer believed that Natalie was murdered, and instead theorized that she had died from either a drug overdose or alcohol poisoning. Then, whoever was with her at the time had such a fear of reprisals that they'd hidden her body to sever any connection to her. Natalie's family denied that she was a drug user, but Commissioner Dom Pig's claims seemed to have led to the 2006 arrest of a suspected drug trafficker. Frustratingly, this trafficker was subsequently released without charge, and the search for those responsible continued. The following year, on April 27th of 2007, around 20 investigations descended on the van der Schlaut family's home in order to conduct an extensive search of the grounds. Using shovels and thin metal rods to penetrate the earth, Dutch authorities all but formally declared that they believed Natalie was buried on the property. Police officers also conducted a thorough analysis of Joran van der Schlaut's laptop in the hopes that some kind of digital evidence could be unearthed. The detectives refused to comment on what prompted the new search, but it seems nothing of interest was discovered. A month later, the Kalpo family's residence was also searched by the Dutch police, but again, the search produced no new developments. 2007 saw van der Schlaut and the Kalpo brothers brought into police custody for a third time, but following their release, it seemed that Natalie Holloway's case was doomed to remain cold. But in January of 2008, a Dutch journalist threatened to blow the case wide open in an incredibly controversial manner. Out of nowhere, a Dutch crime reporter named Peter de Vries announced that he had solved the mystery of Natalie's disappearance. He had enlisted the help of Patrick van der Eem, a Dutch businessman and ex-convict who had placed hidden microphones in his car before gaining Joran van der Schlaut's trust. After sharing cannabis with Patrick, Joran confessed that he was with Natalie when she began to have a seizure. He then attempted to revive her but failed in his attempt. Then after being advised by a friend to dispose of her body, he did just that and tossed her into the sea. It was a compelling story, but it was one that proved to be completely false. Not only did the Aruban police state that none of the details added up, but Joran later stated that he'd made the whole thing up while under the influence of cannabis. It was only in an interview with Fox News the following November that Joran claimed to have finally told the truth and it made for the most shocking confession of all. On November 24th, Buran told an American journalist that he had sold Natalie as a slave to a shadowy ring of international human traffickers. Buran also claimed that his father had paid off two police officers 
who had learned that Natalie had been taken to Venezuela to be sold to a wealthy client. But again, he later retracted these statements when the case was about to be reopened. Yet this time, there was actual evidence for his claims. And to vindicate themselves, Fox News played a snippet of a phone conversation between Yoran and an unidentified older man, one in which the man seemed to be aware of Yoran's involvement in a human trafficking ring. 2010 saw Yoran give yet another confession, claiming he disposed of Natalie's body in a marsh in Aruba. But by this stage, it became increasingly suspicious that he was only making these false claims to protect the human trafficking ring. Some suggested that they were ordering him to muddy the waters, so to speak, in order to throw the authorities off their scent, and that they'd threaten to kill his mother if he didn't retract the one true confession he'd made. 2010 also saw another sickening development in the case, one which would make it painfully clear that Joran van der Schlaut was a deeply malevolent individual. On March 29th, Joran contacted Natalie's mother's legal team and offered to reveal the location of her burial if she paid him a quarter of a million dollars. Incredibly, Natalie's mother wired him a partial payment of $10,000, promising to pay him the rest after the recovery of Natalie's body. It was a rash but strangely prudent decision, as the information she was subsequently provided with proved to be completely false. Yoran was then charged with wire fraud, but instead of facing extradition to the United States, he fled into the depths of South America. Yet his escape didn't mark the end of this story, and the late spring of 2010 would bring forth another shocking development. On May 30th of 2010, Exactly five years since Natalie's disappearance, a 21-year-old business student named Stephanie Flores Ramirez was reported missing in the Peruvian capital of Lima. Three days later, she was found dead in the bathroom of an expensive hotel room, and the name that hotel room was registered under was none other than Joran van der Schlaut. The next day, Yoran was arrested in Chile on a murder charge and extradited back to Peru just 24 hours later. Then, while in police custody, he confessed to killing Flores after she found information on his laptop which linked him to the murder of Natalie Holloway. Before being sentenced to 28 years in prison, Yoran once again denied any involvement in Natalie's disappearance, saying he only tried to extort her mother as a kind of revenge for making his life a living hell for the past five years. The following year, in June of 2011, Natalie Holloway was officially declared dead in absentia, and to this day her body has never been found. It's safe to say that Joran van der Schlaut was somehow involved in her demise, but which of his confessions is the actual truth? Did Joran simply panic after she overdosed, or did he kill her? just like he killed Stephanie Flores Ramirez in his Peruvian hotel room. Or perhaps there's an even more sinister explanation for Natalie's disappearance, one involving an international human trafficking ring. It may well be a long, long time before we learn the truth regarding Natalie's fate, but there's also a chance that there are people out there working very, very hard to ensure no one else learns the truth at all. Until the age of six, Alicia McPhail lived in a small Scottish town of Airdrie in North Lanarkshire with her mother Georgina and her four-year-old sister, Courtney. Her mother and father separated when she was just three months old, but the lack of parental stability didn't seem to affect Alicia's demeanor. Her head teacher once described her as a smiley, happy young girl who loved being at school. Her father, Robert, lived out on the Isle of Butte with his parents, and Alicia would visit them every other weekend, as well as during summer break. That's how she ended up on the island during June of 2018, when she traveled to the town of Rothsey for what was supposed to be a three-week vacation. On the evening of July 1st, just three days into her visit, Alicia's grandparents tried to put her to bed, but like many children her age, Alicia was a sleep fighter. Her grandparents begged and pleaded with her, then eventually came to an agreement. 
She would go to bed, as agreed, but only if they let her watch Peppa Pig until she fell asleep. It was a deal that Alicia's grandparents snapped up in an instant, and after tucking her into bed with Peppa's dulcet tones heard in the background, Alicia quickly dozed off into a deep slumber. A few hours later, Robert's girlfriend, Tony McLaughlin, snuck into Alicia's room to check on her. Finding Alicia fast asleep, Tony assumed that Alicia would safely sleep through the night, just as she usually did. Little did she know, it was little Alicia's last night on earth, because someone of an unspeakable evil was headed their way to change their lives forever. Although he was born in the English town of Shrewsbury in 2002, Aaron Thomas Campbell moved up to Scotland with his family when he was four or five years old. His childhood was a relatively stable one, but his alcoholic mother often subjected him to emotional and occasionally physical abuse. His teenage years might have been characterized by ADHD tests, depression, and bouts of self-harm, but Aaron was no loner. He maintained a fairly large circle of friends, kept fit and active, and was charismatic enough to put himself in front of camera and videos that he uploaded to YouTube. When he was just 15, Aaron began to fantasize about committing an act of serious violent crime, and in 2017, he sent a Facebook message to a close friend saying he might kill one day for the lifetime experience. Aaron's parents recognized this potential for destructive behavior when they caught him starting fires, and they rushed him to a therapist in the hopes that such behavior could be nipped in the bud. Aaron was subsequently entered into a behavior correction program, and for a while, he seemed to be responding to the treatment. Yet unbeknownst to his parents, the mellowing of Aaron's personality was less due to the rehab program's cognitive therapies and more down to the fact that he was excessively using cannabis. Cannabis he was purchasing from none other than Alicia's father, Robert McPhail. On the evening of July 1st of 2018, a 16-year-old Aaron went over to a friend's house for a few drinks. It was supposed to be a celebratory occasion, yet Aaron's mood seemed to worsen as the night went on. Shortly after midnight, a friend found an extremely intoxicated Aaron lying in one of the home's beds, openly contemplating taking his own life. He complained that his mother had been drinking again, and that he'd engaged in a particularly vicious argument with her before arriving at the party. Such a fractured relationship resulted in him being deeply unhappy, and Aaron wondered aloud why he should carry on living when he couldn't maintain a loving bond with his own mother. Naturally, Aaron's friends were extremely concerned about him, and offered him a bed for the night so that he wouldn't have to return home and face another confrontation. But Aaron declined, declaring that he wanted to find some cannabis to smoke, and after departing his friend's house at around 1.30am, he began calling his regular dealers to check their availability. One of the people Aaron called was Robert McPhail, but when Robert failed to answer his phone, Aaron came up with another plan to obtain cannabis. He knew Robert was in possession of some and, if he wouldn't willingly sell it to him, Aaron would obtain it by force. So after retrieving a butcher's knife from his family's kitchen, Aaron left his house at exactly 1.54am and walked the short distance over to the McPhail's house. Despite the small cannabis trade, the crime rate in the town of Rothsey is extremely low. It's the kind of place where people feel no compulsion to lock their car or garages, and it's not unusual for folks to simply leave their front door keys in the lock. In light of this, it was shockingly easy for Aaron to gain access to the McPhail's home. Six-year-old Alicia was sleeping in one of the ground floor rooms, a room that just so happened to be the closest to the front door, and by happenstance, this was the room that Aaron entered first in his attempt to steal. Aaron would later tell police that when he saw Alicia silently slumbering in her bed, he saw what he called a moment of opportunity, adding that once I saw her, all I could think about was killing her. And so, instead of continuing his search to steal cannabis, Aaron lifted the sleeping girl from her bed and stole her instead. The McPhail home was just a short distance away from a small stretch of shoreline 
and as Aaron carried a sleeping Alicia along its ashen gray sands, she suddenly woke up. Upon asking who he was, Aaron told Alicia he was her father before telling her that he was taking her home. Instead, he carried her to an isolated section of the beach, then stabbed her to death. As she lay lifeless in the sand, Aaron stripped himself of his blood-stained clothes, then went home to wash the blood from his hands. At around 6 a.m. that same morning, Alicia's grandfather woke up to find that she was no longer in her bed. He was concerned, but after finding her bicycle in the back garden, he was confident that she couldn't have gotten too far. Nevertheless, Alicia's grandmother reported her missing to the local police force at around 6.23 a.m., while the rest of the household began to search the surrounding area of any signs of her. When she woke up, Robert McPhail's girlfriend noticed she had two missed calls from Aaron Campbell, but when she asked what they were about, he replied to her with, Sorry, doesn't matter, complete with two laughing emojis. Robert's girlfriend then asked Aaron to keep an eye out for Alicia, and to that he replied with, Oh, I'm sure she hadn't gone too far. By 7 a.m., a volunteer from the Coast Guard was searching the same stretch of shoreline where Aaron had carried a sleeping Alicia, and after discovering a bloodied kitchen knife, he informed the local police that something terrible might have happened. The Scottish police raced into action, ordering a helicopter search team to scour the surrounding area in the hope that Alicia could be brought home alive. But less than two hours later, a member of the public contacted them with the news that no one wanted to hear. Alicia's naked, lifeless body had been discovered in a wooded area of the grounds of a former hotel, having sustained almost 120 separate injuries. After the Scottish police made an urgent appeal to the general public, Aaron's mother decided to check the CCTV footage from the camera system she had installed outside her home. This was how she discovered that Aaron's departure and return from her home lined up exactly with the times that Alicia had gone missing. When she questioned him over it, Aaron denied knowing anything about the case, and while she outwardly professed satisfaction with his answer, she immediately took the footage to the local police. Aaron was then approached by two Scottish homicide detectives, not as a suspect, but as a potential witness. It was only during questioning when his responses to questions seemed inconsistent that the police decided to arrest him for murder. The following day, he was officially interviewed under caution, meaning the police strongly suspected him of being Alicia's murderer. It's not clear what evidence had been obtained, but it was enough for a judge to decide that Aaron should be detained while more was gathered. At his trial for the abduction and murder of six-year-old Alicia, the evidence of Aaron's guilt was presented to the court. Not only was the footage of Aaron leaving his house shown to the court, proving he could have been present at the scene of the crime, but the jury also saw footage from another CCTV camera which showed an individual walking along the shoreline at around 2.25 a.m. The individual matched Aaron's physical description and appeared to show them carrying something. Then coupled with a pathologist's testimony that Alicia's clean and uninjured feet indicated that she had been carried and had made for a damning indictment indeed. Aaron's mother then stood at the witness stand and confirmed that the discarded bloody clothes that were found on the beach all belonged to her son. She also confirmed that there was a knife missing from her kitchen and that the one found was identical to the one that was missing. A forensic scientist then delivered the coup de grace when he announced that Aaron's DNA had been recovered from Alicia's body and that there was a billion to one chance that he was not the little girl's killer. However, before the trial was over, the court was forced to listen to Aaron's perverted attempt at defending himself. He attempted what is known in British law as a special defense of incrimination, and had his lawyer argue that Robert McPhail's girlfriend, Tony McLaughlin, was responsible for Alicia's death. Aaron claimed that he and Robert's girlfriend had been intimate on the night of Alicia's death, and that she'd framed him by employing the prophylactic that they'd used to plant his DNA on Alicia's corpse. Rightfully so, McLaughlin was sickened by the accusation, 
and told the courtroom that she loved the child to pieces and that they had a great relationship. Aaron was so psychopathetically aloof to the whole ordeal that one journalist described him as being completely unfazed as he agreed that it would be truly evil of him to try and lay the blame on an innocent person. Then, after having stated this, it was categorically proven that Tony McLaughlin would be physically incapable of carrying Alicia for a sustained period of time, a feat that would be very possible for the weightlifting Aaron Campbell. Aaron's trial lasted nine days, and when it ended on February 21st of 2019, the jury took just three hours to return a unanimous guilty verdict. Aaron remained completely emotionless while the verdict was read aloud. The presiding judge described the evidence presented against Aaron as overwhelming and declared that he committed one of the most wicked and evil crimes this court has ever heard of in decades of dealing with depravity. Yet perhaps the most disturbing aspect of the trial was Aaron's sentencing, as it included a prepared statement from clinical psychologist and social worker Dr. Gary McPherson. Dr. McPherson said that he had conducted several interviews with Aaron who had confessed to feeling very satisfied with the murder of little Alicia. Aaron also said that at certain points of the trial, it had taken all his strength to keep from bursting out laughing when some of the details were read out before the court. Dr. McPherson also revealed that Aaron had told him of his continuing desire to kill, and that he had fantasies of defiling the corpses of those whose lives he'd taken. In light of such a damning verdict, the judge handed Aaron a sentence of 27 years and stated that the sentence would have been even higher if Aaron had been a fully developed adult. It was a hefty sentence, but those close to Alicia believed Aaron should have been locked up for life. Aaron's mother told a gathering of journalists that a life sentence should be a life sentence. He should have no human rights. He doesn't deserve anything. Because Aaron Campbell is not human. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your stories featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, Puck Wudgie stole my pajamas. <laughs>